So last week we did this uh, brief look at Birch. I will do a very quick recap, and then we'll move on to an improved version, version called Betula that we recently published. So the main idea of Birch is to summarize the data in clustering features. A clustering feature is a compact summary statistic of a subpart of the data. And these clustering features are organized in a tree. We will see this in a minute. The clustering features are pretty compact. They consist of an integer count of a vector for the linear sum and for the sum of squares. And based on that, they define distance measures they use in building the tree. So formally, it is defined as the count, the linear sum, and the sum of the squared norms, which will be used to compute things akin to variance of that clustering feature. And since these are sums, if I have two such features, I can add these and get a combined feature very trivially. And that is the, the key motivation here. And based on that, we can then define the radius and the diameter, which is used to decide whether to begin a new clustering feature or whether to add the data to an existing. And this is based on this computation down here, sum of squares minus the average, or the squared of the average linear sum. And this is, of course, closely related to this computation. expected value of the squares minus the expected value to the square. Now, this computation is prone to numerical instability whenever the values become similar. And they tend to become similar when the average is large, when the average is not close enough to 0. And since we want to have these clustering features cover different parts of the tree, of the data. They can't be zero. Otherwise, we wouldn't use them, need them at all. Then everything would be a central <laughs> Gaussian. So this is, ends up being a problem depending on the precision that you need and that you use. And it may also explain why some of the methods they discussed didn't work too well for them. They discuss in the paper that they have these measures, but some of them didn't quite work. So based on this, they define distances. Some of these are very easy, Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance. I think Euclidean distance, for example, is the only one that's implemented in sklearn. All the other parts here are missing. I think variance increase is one of the most interesting ones. Inter and intercluster are kind of um, odd, but nevertheless interesting. And all of, the, uh, all of the more complex ones have the same problem of numerical accuracy because we have a subtraction of values that tends to be similar. And that leads to what is called catastrophic cancellation in floating point. It wouldn't be an issue if you were using integers only, but well, if you want to compute square rules, eventually we need floats. So um, these have some, some interesting properties. Um, we, when analyzing them, we noticed that D2 and D3, um, the, they are, some of them are related to the radius and the diameter that we had. One of them is pretty much the same thing. I think D2 is, um, or D3, I think, is the diameter we had on the previous slide, except that it is um, kind of defined on a combined feature instead of two features. And the distances are defined on two features. And it, well, since we're only using this absorption threshold, when virtually adding a point, we might as well use the distance. So um, these, these are our um, distances that defined here. And they don't quite um, work numerically. So we had to improve them. And the standard technique that you would use when 
uh, trying to avoid um, the problematic computation of variance is to directly aggregate the data differently. So you don't want to aggregate uh, x squared and uh, because this value tends to become too large. And there are several algorithms already published, some of them in the 70s, on how to do this incrementally, such as Welford's algorithm, the variant in Knut. So Knut, the art of computer programming, is one of the most famous computer uh, programming textbooks. And that already contained a better computation. All these features, clustering features, are used in a tree. Now that's the, like the algorithmic view of the tree. If you think of the tree in terms of data, it usually means we have some cluster somewhere, and that is one clustering feature. And then we may have another, and another, and another. So that's probably these down here. And they are combined into one clustering feature in the next level. And this way, we approximate the data with these micro clusters. These are small groups of data that where we try to limit the radius. And if we would perfectly limit the radius, this would give us some kind of error guarantee. But in Birch, the primary objective is the memory limit, not so much the radius. So eventually, if the memory, if we run out of memory, we would increase the radius, enhance the error, but we compress the data into a more compact form. And well, we, if we add points, for example, a new point that is similar to one of the existing ones, we will begin in the top, as with pretty much any search tree, then we will identify maybe the closest leaf in that level. At this point, using the distance functions that we had, so for example, using Euclidean distance to the cluster center or the feature center, then we go to the next level and again find the closest one, which may be this. And then we will be using this radius or diameter criterion to ensure that this cluster feature does not get too big. And if it's small enough after adding the point, then we could add the point to the summary statistics of this. And either we can do, do this immediately, or usually you would propagate the change upwards and also adjust the um, summary statistics of the parent. And this could further then proceed uh, in the tree upwards. So the tree is not limited to two levels. It's just on the slide. It is a balanced tree by the way it is built. So unless you remove data, which is not discussed at all, um, it would remain balanced. Because um, the only way the tree grows is if you have too many cluster features in the root node. Then the root node will be split. And there will be a new root node that has two clustering features. So that is a very typical strategy of balancing. Balancing has a nice property that the paths are, have the same length. And we don't get degenerate cases where the path becomes very long. We only store these aggregates. So we won't be working with the original data points anymore at this point. Now, what a lot of um, cases, a lot of implementations do when, when clustering is to only use the leaf level and ignore everything above. And in many cases, it, such as sklearn, they will just transform each of them to a cluster center and then run, for example, hierarchical clustering or k-means on these cluster centers. In some cases, these clustering features themselves are considered to be the clusters, which usually tends to produce many more clusters than you wanted, because it's just covering the data. So don't be surprised if the um, 
implementation sklearn does not work very well for you. It's just very incomplete. Now, we improved these clustering features for what is called Betula. And instead of using the discount and the, the linear sum of the vectors, we directly use the mean. And the mean can be incrementally updated with this equation, which is not particularly different, difficult. So instead of taking the linear sum, we now will be using directly storing the center, which is nice because we need a center for searching. Whenever inserting, we need a center. Whenever working later on, we need a center anyway. So the center, um, storing the center is, um, say, let's say, desirable anyway, instead of using the linear sum. It's slightly more um, expensive because we have to compute this weighting factor once, which is a division, but yeah, that is all in, uh, negated by memory cache effects. So consider adding a single point then this mu b will simply be some x, some x i that we're adding. And if we add a single point, it will have a count of one. That's another nice property. Um, if we add a single point, um, it has no standard deviation, no squared deviation. So this will be zero for a single point. This will be one for a single point. So a lot of these uh, things simplify when adding a single point. Instead of taking the sum of squares the, or the sum of the squared norms of the vectors, which is what was causing the numerical problems, the mean itself was fine, we directly want to aggregate the deviation from the center. And that, um, it's not obvious that we can do this incrementally. That we don't need to go back to the data whenever we have a new mean, which would be very expensive. But we can do this using the equation on the right hand side. It exists in several variations. This is um, the one that we um, use here because it doesn't have a division in here, meaning it can be computed very fast. So we have the previous deviations and we have the deviation from the center. And now one part that is surprising, but it follows if you um, do the de derivation of these equations. We have the old center and the new center. Both of them are used once. And be careful when looking up these equations on Wikipedia because every now and then someone thinks this is a mistake and undoes this change and then there's a the wrong equation on Wikipedia again, and then someone realizes this, fixes it, and so forth. So this is kind of based on what we've seen all the time with word linkage, for example, that the increase in variation when combining two clusters is based on the distance of the centers. Okay, and yeah, you could do a covariance the same way. So um, we've published a paper with a few of these um, derivations and also how you can parallelize this with um, AVX or GPUs to make this more efficient, more scalable. So that seems to be a very minor change, in fact. So the idea of using the mean instead of the linear sum probably some implementations already did this. I think the sklearn implementation stores both for some reason, because it's more efficient to have the mean and the linear sum because that's how it was defined. So the interesting part is really not storing the sum of squares, but this square deviation from the center. That means we need to change all the equations. That was some work to chuckle around these, these equations and make them work. But it turns out that many of them are not more difficult. 
So we don't need to discuss Euclidean distance and Manhattan distance. They just use the center as easy as it can get. We can look at the intra-cluster distance. And there we have the same effect again that we, um, we do like the, C, the means matter most. But we also get some average of the deviation from each cluster. So spread of cluster A, spread of cluster B, and the distance of the centers. And this is the inter-cluster distance. The intra-cluster distance, which was the motivation for the diameter, and the diameter criterion they used for absorption, um, is kind of based on this idea of pairwise distances, the average pairwise distance. And it is also a very similar equation. This time, we first add the two um, spread and then divide, use the, like the weighting. This will cancel out, but this way it is more efficient to compute with a single division. And the, like the combined the centers. We have the variance increase distance. And this one turns out to be really pretty. And that is exactly what was happening with ward linkage. So now it's easy to see that this is uh, as well behaved as it can become numerically. It is as well behaved as Euclidean distance. But it's kind of a class a weighted um, version of the Euclidean distance then. And then we can, uh, the radius, the radius conceptually is like the um, standard deviation of the cluster. This was the sum of the squared deviations. This is the average squared deviation. And hence, this becomes like a standard deviation. And that's more nicely visible in this uh, writing. Now, this is like the combined feature. So we have to put in the combination for equation from the previous slide. And that way, we get this equation on the right hand side. OK, so we can, we can replace and fix all of these equations. And now we don't have the numerical instabilities anymore because we don't have the subtraction of two very similar values. The subtractions that we have in here, as it can easily be seen, they are all the distance, squared Euclidean distance of the centers. Well, if, if these don't work, we have pretty uh, nasty data anyway, and nothing will work if the distances don't work. But um, I mean, if these, this value becomes badly behaved, that means the two points need to be very close. The, the means need to be almost the same. But that's the point where I always reach uh, floating point limitations if I have all the points are close. So um, it's not worse than any other algorithm, not worse than k-means or anything. And now we can use this to accelerate algorithms. For example, we can discuss accelerating k-means. In the, in the paper, we also discuss Gaussian mixture modeling, for example. Um, so there are different ways that we can exploit the information more smartly than what people have been doing so far. The people have been using the centers as points. But if I'm doing k-means, why only use the center? I can also use the weight. So if I know that this cluster, this cluster feature represents 100 points and the other one represents one point, the one with 100 points should, of course, matter much more, in particular to finding the cluster centers. So um, the weight in k-means is easy to use, trivial to use. So on that side, it's easy. We could also look at whether it makes sense to use the variance. We have this uh, standard, uh, the sum of squared deviations in this uh, equation. And we can actually use this in k-means to estimate the quality of the result in a more reliable way. 
But you in clustering, you don't need this information. So it's interesting, some part for initialization, it can be interesting for evaluating the quality in the end, because it gives an upper bound um, for the total sum of squares of the resulting clustering. But um, we don't need it for the actual clustering. The main question is, beta has these parameters. We have radius, diameter as absorption criterion. We have these distances, d0, d1, d2, d3, d4. Which is the best distance to use if we want to later on use k-means? So that is the part that well, we have a publication in preparation also. And if we are doing hierarchical clustering, um, we can begin this clustering process with an arbitrary distance matrix. So why would I always use the Euclidean distance of the cluster centers? I can put anything in there. I can uh, try, it, for example, to do group average linkage by maybe choosing the appropriate verge distance to initialize my matrix. And I can also want to choose the parameter for the distance function used by Birch or Betula um, to um, get like the best data aggregation for a particular linkage. So all these are interesting um, properties. So for k-means, the answer is, from a theoretical point of view, is pretty clear. We want to have this intra-cluster um, equation because that most closely resembles the variance objective that we want to optimize in k-means. It's not the same as, as this variance increase, but they want to minimize the variance. But it turns out that in experiments, the difference between them are, is really tiny. And there are other factors that sh overshadow the actual choice of the distance function, such as memory limit. When does it rebuild the tree? And that um, if the tree rebuild will, of course, decrease the quality. In hierarchical clustering, depending on the linkage, we can choose different measures. For example, we could use Euclidean or Manhattan linkage if you want to do single linkage as simple type of approach. But for example, the intra-cluster inter distance resembles the group average linkage. The intra-cluster distance resembles the minimum variance linkage. That is a very uncommon linkage strategy, also not available in, in SQLearn. And the variance increase resembles what? So um, that is the um, already observed uh, property. So if I want to accelerate an approximate word linkage on a large data set, I know, know what I can do. I can use this type of aggregation to produce a smaller data set. And then I can use the variance increase uh, linkage and get the distance of clustering features as it would be returned by word if we had aggregated the leaves the same way. So that gives me a most consistent um, way of clustering and scaling hierarchical clustering to much larger data sets. We can also accelerate Gaussian mixture modeling, which we had last week. Now we need to extend the cluster features, at least if we want a more complex um, Gaussian model. We will still be using the weight and the center. If I have the most simple case, scale unit matrix, I can use proceed as I previously worked. If I want to use a diagonal model, I now need separate squared deviations in each axis. So I need to make my clustering feature longer and store the squared deviation in each dimension separately instead of aggregating them. But the computation remains the same. The equation that we gave was the univariate case and would have a sum over all dimensions. So um, that is also straightforward. 
And if I want the covariate model with the full matrix, I can do this, but my square deviations here will now be essentially uh, n times the covariance matrix of the data. And I can incrementally update this. And this will still work, and I can use, still use it for building the B2 let V. I wouldn't use the covariance matrix when, while building the tree. So you could try to use like a Manlobe distance type of thing in there. But the problem is um, that if I have very few data points, the covariances will still be unreliable. So it makes sense to aggregate them to a spherical model while building the tree. But um, afterwards, we can um, proceed with this, and then we can find rotated Gaussians based on the summary statistics. Because it's essentially a covariance matrix, and aggregating covariance matrices is possible. So um, I can aggregate clustering features and add these ma matrices, and um, I need to make this adjustment for the center distance. But then I have the covariance matrix of that subset of data. And it will be exact in the sense that this is really the covariance matrix of all the data points that were added to these leaves. So it's not just an approximation. The only thing is that I cannot assign points differently in the same leaf. So the result will be an approximation to the full Gaussian mixture modeling, but it will be much cheaper. And well, I have these weights. Everything else then proceeds as we um, know it. It turns out it is simple to um, treat the, to consider the cluster center when computing the Gaussian density only, which is not clear and not, let, let's say it's not quite the correct way, but it's much cheaper and uh, gives pretty much the same results as if we would try to make it uh, more accurate. If we would try to more, make it more accurate, we could assume that our cluster feature is like a small Gaussian located in this particular place. It has covariance and all of that. And then I have my cluster, my cluster center somewhere of my Gaussian model, of my Gaussian mixture model. And this one also has some standard deviations. And what I would need to do to be more accurate is to compute the overlap of these two Gaussians, kind of integrating over everything and the, the, like the product of these two distributions, which is possible, but it doesn't give any better results, but it is slower. You need to, to find like, like some touching point and uh, then can integrate along this one axis. Um, but yeah, it's, it's complicated and doesn't quite pay off. It is much simpler to only consider the PDF of the center when computing the cluster responsibilities. And yeah, we could, didn't observe any drawback of doing this, except that it is theoretically not the right thing. 